All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Pringle for our second session on post-conflict transitions. And welcome to our moderator, Dr. Scott Gardner. He is the provost and chief academic officer at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. He previously held the position of director of the Penn State School of International Affairs, where he remains a faculty affiliate. His research focuses on great power conflict, counterterrorism, conflict mediation, policy assessment, and of course, most relevant to us this morning, women, peace, and security. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. Gartner. The, the floor is yours. Uh, so let's start out real quickly by creating a pyramid. So we start at the base, as we should always in any conference presentation and panel, and say, why do we care about the theme? Why do we care about women, peace, and security? Why is it important? Um, and I think the key answer is it contributes to the war fighting advantage, and it contributes in a number of different ways. Right now, the United States, particularly uh, United States Navy, where I'm employed, uh, faces two pacing threats. Uh, the first is the PRC. The second is the United States labor market. At this point, neither none of the services have been able to meet their recruiting quotas across the board for enlisted or for officers. And there's a challenge in populating our military with the best and the brightest who are able to compete, particularly since given the first pacing threat, we're smaller in terms of the population and we're smaller in terms of the military. So we need high quality committed people. Ruling out half of our population is a bad way to start. So if we can be more inclusive, figure out how to make women a bigger part of the military, that will dramatically have an impact on our ability to be an effective fighting force and contribute to the warrior advantage. The second reason is diversity, having different perspectives, different point of views, just like you want to have a diversified stock portfolio, you want to have a diversified staff, a diversified population that you're drawing from, a diversified crew, so that people are approaching things with different perspectives, different ideas, and you're stronger as a result. The third is normative. It's a good idea. It's the right thing to do. Women, peace, and security is the right idea. And it's not just the right idea, but allows, contributes to the warrior advantage by leading through quality, leading through ideas. I would argue leading through leadership. So that's the floor of our pyramid. The answer to why women, peace, and security is it contributes to the warrior advantage. Then why this panel on post-conflict transitions? We all know as leaders that the key is hiring good people, coming up with good ideas, and follow through. And if you look at military situations, national security situations, post-conflict transitions can be thought of as follow through. You can look at NATO coming out of World War II, Korea. Those are very successful stories, outcomes for the United States with very successful follow through. So the reason we're looking at post-conflict transition is that if you win the war and lose the peace, you lost the war. And so the transition is critical to obtaining and executing the outcomes that you started the war with. And that's particularly the case for women, peace, and security, which tends to be less visible, um, less important, which is why we're having viewed as less important, which is why we're having this conference trying to raise its importance and uh, needs to be more deliberately addressed. And so you have to think about how to deliberately address it in the post-conflict transition. Then the third question in our pyramid is, well, why are these folks that's sitting next to me who I'll introduce to you in a second? What makes them special to talk about post-conflict transitions in a women, peace, and security conference? And the answer is they're both outstanding academics and incredibly experienced, operationally experienced individuals. So they're going to blend their operational knowledge and their academic insights together, which I think is, is kind of the secret sauce to creating really impactful observations. Um, so we have three, as I said, outstanding experience folks. We have Dr. Amanda Metcalf from the United States Air Academy. Uh, Professor Metcalf has also served as a practitioner for years and years, dealing with uh, extensive cases of military trauma, both individually and through policy as well as addressing family issues throughout the United States military and especially the Air Force. We're gonna hear from Mr. Joe Evans, who's uh, at Villanova University in the, finishing up his 
doctorate in theology. And Mr. Evans is former lieutenant colonel in the Army, has extensive experience in the United States and around the world operationally in addressing uh, the situations that we're talking about. We're going to hear from Dr. Natalie Abu from the Military Academy of the Armed Forces of the Republic of Moldova. In addition to perhaps claiming the I came the furthest for this conference uh, award, um, uh, she's an experienced and uh, uh, well-regarded academic who also ex uh, worked extensively in Moldovan policy groups, setting Moldovan policy on 1325 and other critical issues. So I think we're in for an exciting panel. We only have 13, pre 13 three presentations. Uh, many of them have four, so we should have uh, some time for some really good discussion. So uh, you all have homework. I'd like to hear a good question from everybody. So, and with that, Amanda, if you'd leave us off, please. All right, thank you, Dr. Gardner. I want to first say thanks to uh, the uh, Naval War College and Dr. Amin for um, inviting me here to talk about something I'm very, very passionate about. Um, broadly, uh, and you heard this from Dr. Gartner, um, I study gender and leadership, and this really means going into countries and looking at strategies that create uh, ethics of gender equality in, in those regions. Today, however, I'm going to focus on two grassroots movements um, as an expression of leadership. Uh, and we'll draw peace insights from these two regions and those two movements. The two movements I'm going to cover is a media approach in Serbia and a local governance approach in Rwanda. I chose these basic uh, these regions because of the basic disruptions that they've uh, incurred. I believe it's important to study post-conflict zones because they impart important insight into peace. And it's particularly important to research those in the context of women's reactions and women's experiences. My aim is to examine the relationship between history, conflict, and social movement. Each of these movements has attempted, and I would argue is doing a pretty good job at addressing some deep structural violence in the region. Okay, so um, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the methodology and uh, the, the kind of walk you through the thinking of, of this research. Um, we all know, and that's why we're here, that uh, women's empowerment is linked to peace, okay? but. A lot of what we know about that linkage uh, relies upon macro data sets. So we've drawn from data sets like the World Economic Forum, uh, varieties of de democracy of Oslo, some conflict data, head of state data, um, and even some UN and uh, Human Rights Commission data. When I start looking at this in the countries I've gone to, sometimes these big data sets tell a really confusing story. They don't always match up. Um, so. When I go in and do this work, I really want to come out with something that I can apply or we can apply as leaders. Um, so in order to do so, we have to ask questions about the history. How does history affect the leadership and the movement? And what's linked to the delivery of these leadership strategies? So on the ground, in the grass. Um, so what we come up with is grassroots movement. Um, in these grassroots movement, peace often operates in really un unconventional ways, uh, pretty nuanced uh, ways. So to capture that, uh, we have to ask micro level questions. And so I use a micro sociological theory from Randall Collins to do my analysis. And the methods are qualitative. I go in and conduct interviews for these two regions, uh, 26 interviews, 24 with women and two with men. And the, the analysis is a focused analysis. So I'm connecting history to the movement uh, in that focused analysis. Okay, so let's start with Serbia. Uh, Serbia sits number 26 in the global gender gap, gap data. Actually, 23, United States is 26. So they're hovering in there with us. Um, in order to understand this movement, we have to get, get a little glimpse of their history. So after World War II, Tito uh, kind of took hold of Yugoslavia. And uh, Tito was considered an authoritarian leader, a socialist leader, um, some would say communist uh, regime, but by all accounts of the participants that I spoke with, um, he was pretty good for women's empowerment. And uh, it was a peaceful time in Yugoslavia. So after the fall of Yugoslavia and Serbia, Milosevic took over and it wasn't quite as peaceful. Uh, during that regime, the, uh, there was a perpetration of a genocide in Bosnia. 12,000 women were raped, 8,000 civilians killed. Those are probably pretty conservative numbers, actually. And by accounts of participants and the Freedom House data, Serbia is currently in a democratic backsliding uh, regime. So let's go to... Uh, Let's go to the strategies. 
Let's make sure we pop this up. Okay. So the first thing I found out is it's pretty dangerous to be a messenger in this movement. Um, there, I'll refer you up to the, the first quote. This is one of the participants talked about being held hostage um, as a journalist. Um, and I talked to some of the the, uh, the younger journalists and, and even some of the heads of states would say it's very dangerous to be a female journalist in this movement, twice as likely to be targeted uh, with death threats, uh, threats to family, and certainly character malaise uh, in, in reporting. Why is it so dangerous? Uh, from, from the reports, uh, when you're calling out gender-based violence, you're also calling out the regime, and war crimes are wrapped into this call out. Okay, so moving to the actual uh, media strategies. So I'm going to focus on the feminist media strategies. Uh, there's a coalition that I'm going to talk about, but the efforts are really linked and uh, wrapped into women's experiences. So the second quote, Apai, uh, talks about the interviewing and the research of survivors and coming up with really basic guidelines in reporting on violence. Okay, so this is really important to remember. Um, this was a coalition that started maybe eight years ago. It started with nine female journalists, and it's grown to 90 men and women who are committed to these guidelines. Um, the UN consults with this uh, coalition group pretty regularly on their own reporting of violence. Um, and then some of the guidelines, there's many guidelines, but three that, that stood out as a very important is the not reporting of victim identities. This implies guilt when you're reporting on violence. Um, the use of graphic details in homicides or rapes or any sort of um, violent event, this produces victim blaming. And then the, uh, the attention to visual cues in uh, any sort of media reporting uh, produces uh, subordination or perspectives of subordination of women. The final uh, theme was the transformative approach that this coalition is taking on. They're moving from what stories are being told to how those stories are told. They rely heavily on the survivor perspectives. Um, and those uh, those perspectives do tie in gender-based violence and experience through the genocide. The empathy is baked into this message and the narratives get people to value others more. Okay, so we'll move on to uh, Rwanda's homegrown movement. A lot of people would say that or ask questions about this being a, a feminist movement, but uh, my response is that this movement started after a genocide where many women were left to clean up the pieces, right? Uh, Rwanda sits number six as far as gender equality uh, in the in the gap data, the World Economic Forum data. So the history of uh, the history of Rwanda is also very important. 1959 was the the first round of geno genocidal attacks, and then 1994, the big one, 800,000 people killed, and mass rapes were also wrapped wrapped into that uh, the ethnic cleansing in in Rwanda. Imperial powers in the 1980s began with the Germans, later the Belgians. So this is really key. In 1935, the Belgians implemented a discriminatory identification system that instigated centralized power in Rwanda. Second event, in the 1980s, the World Bank implemented a structural adjustment program that instigated the prioritization of privatization in, uh, in Rwanda. So you can imagine the two of those blended together can, would, would produce some, some tensions and conflict. So on to the strategies. Uh, homegrown solutions is what they call this. Uh, the first uh, part of the solutions is the reliance on local knowledge. And there's a lot of ways that Rwandans do this, but I'll highlight the gachacha process. Our, our provost uh, spoke to this a, a little bit in, in the um, introduction of this symposium. The gachacha is an ancient process wherein uh, the community at a small level um, addresses perpetrators. Okay, And uh, they rely heavily on truth and details of the truth. So often asking questions about who did you rape? Who did you kill? How did you kill them? And where are the bodies, right? Gruesome details, but that's important in uh, producing remorse, forgiveness, and then ultimately reintegration. So the gachacha process is moving away from uh, international court systems to the tribal court systems. And by their accounts, this worked fairly well. The other strategy is Rwandi identity. So they call this Ubuntu. This is another word for unity, moving away from the identification from Hutu and Tutsi or perpetrator and survivor to we are all just Rwandans. The last one is a trust in the community. Okay, and this one it was it was pretty impressed uh, impressive to me, and and a couple things wrapped into this. Numbukami is a word for ten houses. So think back to that uh, identification system that the Belgians implemented in the 30s. 
This is really a process of decentralizing. So 10 houses is the opposite of the Belgians' centralization uh, efforts. And boozy is a word for trusted judges. So at a small level in the community, essentially these judges and panels of judges, which now requires 30% of them be, being women um, after the genocide, there's care for those communities at a very local level. They uh, work with these teams at 10 house levels to address economic issues, conflict issues, crime, environmental concerns, and resource distribution. So this movement, these three strategies really uh, acknowledge old approaches that were stripped away from Rwandans. And it lands upon a valued process and shared values that people believe civil liberties truly depend upon. The takeaway from these two movements, uh, the policy and principle implications are we really do need to ask questions that surround history. We need to ask questions that surround women. We need to focus on deep structures. And I'll um, jump back to, to uh, what Valerie Hudson um, proclaims is very important, how we treat our women is uh, how we treat our state. That's really addressing deep structure. Um, we need to explore strategies from the grass. And in doing so, we'll discover approaches that sway beliefs, attitudes, and ultimately change how people's, people value others. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so Nepal is a small South Asian country uh, between India and China. Uh, it faces frequent major natural disasters and a decade-long civil war that ended in 2006. These challenges are exacerbated by high rates of human trafficking, gender-based violence, discriminatory social norms, and poverty. Despite a growing consensus for the importance of women's involvement in the process for peace and security, gender discrimination continues to restrict the participation of women in Nepalese decision-making processes. I look at how incorporating women, peace, and security, or WPS, into military security cooperation programs can be a source of mitigating these issues. I'll argue that incorporating WPS into security cooperation is both necessary and feasible. Likewise, security cooperation, like warfare, should be planned and conducted with the ultimate objective of achieving peace, and WPS can help. These programs can offer a strategic advantage as part of a multi-track diplomacy process, which corresponds to most peace-building frameworks. I start with a brief examination of defense planning and contextual aspects of peace and conflict in Nepal, and then evaluate the contribution of WPS-related security cooperation programs. This is part of a larger project that examines the benefits of collaboration between military security cooperation and religious peace building. Uh, but today I'll focus on the importance and benefits of WPS programs and security cooperation using Nepal as a case study. I base much of this on, on my experience as the Chief of Defense Cooperation in Kathmandu from 2014 to 2017 and WPS initiatives that we implemented during that time. I'll also rely on insight from female peacebuilding scholars, as well as concepts of multi-track diplomacy as an approach for peace, as outlined by Ambassador John McDonald and Louise Diamond. The purpose of defense planning, whether for war or other purposes, including security cooperation, should aim for, to establish a sustainable peace. As an infantry officer in Afghanistan and Iraq, I saw that this planning commonly fails to account for women who comprise over half the population and were generally the most affected by war. Armed conflict inflicts damage on vulnerable populations that if left untreated can fester and lead to sustained violence and instability. Women suffer disproportionately both during and after a war. This includes disruption to their family and social networks, amplification of existing gender inequalities, an increased threat of trafficking and sexual exploitation, and the loss of basic rights like education and safety. Fortunately, numerous directives and guidance reinforce the integration of WPS initiatives, starting with all those described uh, throughout this symposium, the national action plans, the executive orders, and guidance from the combatant commands. Despite these incentives, incentives, there's still likely to be some resistance. No matter the cultural or bureaucratic challenges, there are ways to navigate obstacles to impl implement these programs. Like many countries, Nepal is a space of great power competition between larger countries. In Nepal, however, the United States is a secondary figure. 
to the influence of China and India. Despite the strategic competition between the U.S. and China, India tends to be more antagonistic to U.S. efforts in Nepal. Given that Nepal is unlikely to purchase expensive U.S. military equipment, as well as pressure from India on the Nepalese government to limit cooperation with others, and that the Nepalese military does not have a strategic external adversary that requires lethal efforts, U.S. security cooperation is best suited to areas such as supporting Nepal's U.N. peacekeeping contribution, disaster response, and WPS. Each of these lines of effort helps to promote peace at the global and local levels by seeking to reduce or mitigate the violence, injustice, and instability. Nepal experienced a 10-year civil war from 1996 to 2006, which not only disrupted the political stability and economic development, but resulted in numerous hardships and threats to the flourishing of women throughout the country, <clears throat> both for combatants and non-combatants. In 2011, though, Nepal became the first South Asian country to adopt a national action plan. As a result, the government has attempted to increase the percentage of women in the security forces and established a ministry for women, children, and social affairs in 2014. Despite these efforts, obstacles remain. For example, gender-based violence and culturally entrenched gender discrimination persist. There are some encouraging trends, such as a woman being named president of Nepal, yet women continue to be sidelined from the influential voices in the post-conflict peace processes and fail to have a proportionate level of participation in government decision-making. So WPS security cooperation programs can make a crucial contribution to promoting peace while also offering a strategic benefit of regional stability. Despite the steps taken by the Nepalese, by the, by the Nepalese government and other directives and guidance, there were no WPS-oriented programs in U.S. security cooperation efforts in Nepal, aside from a few humanitarian assistance projects. In fact, of the thousands of U.S. student training nominations from 20, uh, sorry, 2008 to 2014, only three were females. The U.S. Excuse me, the U.S. Office of Defense Cooperation, or the ODC in Nepal, developed a plan to integrate WPS initiatives into its security cooperation programs in 2014. The primary areas of focus were U.N. peacekeeping operations, post-conflict security sector development, humanitarian assistance projects, and a special emphasis on appropriate female nominations for U.S. funded courses. Each program attempted to incorporate WPS objectives of participation, prevention, and protection. Likewise, post-conflict and disaster response efforts included WPS principles of relief and recovery. Some programs effectively addressed all areas of emphasis. For example, the ODC developed a girls' mentorship program with an annual workshop for female students capitalizing on the expertise of female graduates of ODC-sponsored training. It was a common refrain from women who returned from training in the U.S. was that they were thrilled with the opportunity to experience and knowledge but they, but the, that they gained, but wished they had been exposed to it when they were younger. So the ODC, excuse me, in collaboration with these female alumni, planned a workshop to share these experience and knowledge with teenage Nepalese girls. The program included mentors from the government, army, and civil society. The three-day workshops, which included hundreds of Nepalese teenage girls, emphasized leadership skills to develop the knowledge and confidence to make a difference in their schools and communities. The workshops were successful and spawned numerous subsequent programs in the schools and communities of the participants. From a peace-building perspective, these programs were invaluable for empowering young women leaders who can contribute to community and national-level efforts while simultaneously addressing aspects of injustice and instability in society, such as human trafficking, gender-based violence, and other discriminatory social practices. There's also a direct correlation in, to the framework of multi-track diplomacy, especially in the areas of conflict resolution, grassroots involvement, education, activism, and raising awareness. Military security cooperation is embedded in, <laughs> excuse me, in this nine-track conceptual and practical framework or a complex system of peacemaking activities. Women's participation in, security, in peace and security cooperation processes can promote enduring and innovative post-conflict outcomes. Unfortunately, women in Nepal remain absent from many official and, official and informal dialogue efforts. This was illustrated in 2015, when Nepal's security cooperation sector development group argued that including women in their conflict transformation dialogue would be a distraction for the men. 
when confronted with this blatant misogyny, the subsequent argument was that there were just not enough qualified women in Nepal. While the WPS programs attempted to mitigate this lack, it highlights a specific gap in the important concept of including all stakeholders, especially women in the process of building peace. Collaboration between security cooperation and civic organizations can help identify gaps in areas of divergence to find an approach that is mutually beneficial. There is a risk as both NGOs and American military assistance can be viewed as foreign intervention, but this danger can be mitigated by inviting local participants into the planning and oversight of the programs. Benefits include maximizing resources and momentum to normalize women in the peace process. One final aspect is to remember that sometimes our best intentions may cause unintended harm. For example, when linking security cooperation WPS programs with economic development projects, we must be aware of how the Western pattern of development has overexploited natural resources, becoming a process of development that subjects women to hardships and exploitation. Suspicion of security cooperation activities can occur at the local and national levels for a variety of reasons. Widespread mistrust can occur because of misperceptions about the intent of foreign programs. Localized concerns can occur, such as just distrust from former combatants or communities who are concerned with outsider meddling. WPS programs can enhance trust at every level, although it can be difficult to navigate the impression that these programs disregard or contradict local cultural norms. In addition to helping build trust, a WPS program can help maintain strategic credibility. China and India do not advertise their events in Nepal but have numerous programs for, for women leaders. The systematic approach of US women, peace and security is simply one among an existing array of options. As Nepalese women are invited to conferences and courses related to women's leadership development in both India and China. Furthermore, WPS programs do not occur in a vacuum, but within a larger context. Our partners are unlikely to differentiate between programs provided by the ODC or USAID or the Department of State. WPS programs can offer a strategic advantage, but they would need to be sustained and expanded to compete with established and better resource programs from other countries. Nepal faces cultural biases, political and social instability, a recent armed conflict, and frequent natural disasters that negatively impact the lives and livelihood of women. WPS programs can contribute to building a more peaceful and stable society, promote the dignity of the marginalized, and enhance trust and credibility at the local and national level by countering factors of suspicion, while also helping to sustain influence amid competing international objectives. Thank you, Joe. Next, we're going to hear from Dr. Natalia Abu on a WPS National Action Implementation in Moldova. Hello to everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm um, delighted to be here and to present uh, very sensitive issues regarding uh, WPS implementation in Republic of Moldova. And uh, it's very good to be the last because it's not enough uh, eight minutes. It's very difficult uh, to present so complex and complicated issues in eight minutes. And in order to keep uh, the time, I will try to emphasize through three main uh, points. First of all, it's very important to understand the context of elaboration of national action plan on women, peace and security, and special security environment of Republic of Moldova. Also, why NEP was adopted? Because it's not um, sufficient to be mandatory. And also, we have less alert and good practices. In uh, this uh, context, it's uh, very important to highlight that recently in the March, the government of Moldova approved the second generation of national action plan, but it was elaborated in a different security environment compared to the period when the first program was adopted. In fact, the geopolitical situation of the country influences its security policies. Neighboring Romania, and NATO member country and Ukraine invaded by Russian Federation, Moldova is a part of extended Black Sea region. And in June 2022, Moldova obtained the status of EU candidate country. More than this, for uh, Moldova, vulnerabilities, cha challenges and threats to national security are interconnected, both internally and externally, having implications for human security as well. 
especially the issues of respect of human rights on the territory of the country which is controlled by the separatist regime. It's also frozen conflict, Transnistria conflict, but the negotiation process is frozen. And it is a um, non-solved conflict, uh, artificial created by, managed by the Russian Federation. Plus, uh, Moldova is a neutral state, but it's not recognized internationally. And the Russian violation violated its neutrality because we have Russian troops on non-controlled territory, but it's peace. Secondly, it's very important to understand why uh, uh, Republic of Moldova adopted and implement now a national election plan on women, peace and security, because at the policy level, Moldova has been assumed the responsibility to take action to implement the resolution 3025 in the framework of the individual partnership action plan, Republic of Moldova and NATO. It's very important to have this push for, at external level and to have this international commitment. In general, at, this, at uh, that stage, the legal uh, framework for ensuring gender equality in Moldova was already developed and functional. Plus, at the regional level and global, there are a lot of uh, uh, study that provided a different argument why you need to implement women, peace and security in, uh, in the context of peace and conflict. At the national level, uh, research was also carried out. It was useful to have this kind of approach regarding the different security needs. It was very helpful for Republic of Moldova, and special when you have to ensure a human security, not only in peacekeeping mission, but also at the national level. But also the results of the survey of uh, on the perception on women in security sector. According to survey, it still exists stereotypes about the role of men and women in military because they think that the sector is very dangerous for women. But in the institution related to public order, citizens are more friendly for gender equality because we believe that more women in the security sector will bring additional value to it. The most obvious benefits are related to fighting corruption, but according to second NEP, because we now have a second NEP, it seems that the war in, in uh, Ukraine changed perception the role of women in peace and conflict because now we have on our territory refugee uh, and the um, 87 uh, percent from the refugee are women and children. In this uh, regarding this aspect, as well as barriers identified regarding the provision of an inclusive security framework, influenced the structure of the plan. I would like to highlight, but during my presentation, I'm going, I'm focusing on uh, process, not on barriers. But barriers very important issue. Yesterday we discussed about that. The third snap. Uh, was uh, primarily focused on women's participation in the security and defense sector using the three basic approaches, reducing stereotypes, second, developing an inclusive and proactive human resources management system, and to create this cooperation with civil society and to, and to strengthen transparency regarding the action of uh, from the um, implementing of Resolution 3025. Regarding the second map, it's uh, focused more on prevention because now we understand it's not a time for reaction. It's important to have this prevention. Since the Republic of Moldova is a country with EU candidate status, with an active war at the border, and it is essential to have this kind of perspective on human rights, as well as the fight against any type of abuse and discrimination to ensure peace and security. And thirdly, Regarding lesson learned and good practices, a well-written app doesn't mean good implementation. I think it's very re reasonable for all country. In fact, the process of implementation of 3025 is uh, often uh, uh, approached as an uphill battle that will involve substantial resistance. And yesterday we spoke about that. Or unforeseen situation can arise such a as a pandemic, because pandemic was very good excuses to not implement women, peace and security activities. And the non-budgeting, because only 27 uh, countries that implement, 27% uh, of countries that implement women, peace and security plans have budgeting for this. Actually, states are different, respectively, the gender issues is tackled differently. And there is a not homogeneous set of 
policies, tools for implementing the OPS agenda. However, it is recommended to organize priority intervention according to the four pillars, uh, pillars that usually stress the state. Pillars for Pillar Strait of Republic of Moldova. And for example, it was difficult to integrate relief and recovery in first national action plan because the leadership used to say, Dr. Albu, we don't have a problem with refugee. But due to misunderstanding of this approach, the need for relevant action on these issues was realized when the war in Ukraine has been started. That's why it's a good um, advice for countries as Republic of Moldova to have this approach not only through four pillars, but to, to structure NEP at the three levels, strategical, operational, and tactical. If you speak about good practices, uh, it's very important to emphasize that a specific element for Republic of Moldova was the elaboration of the ministerial action plan depending on the institutional needs and the different capacity at the internal level and external level. Because uh, it's complicated to increase women participation in security and defense sector if you don't have a special regulation reg regarding harassment and discrimination. And uh, it's very important to have this mainstreaming approach of gender in the security and defense sector. For example, we integrated in the national defense strategy the gender aspect of the ch uh, chapter of human resources. And else it's very important to implement at the external level because we have understand that security for whom or for who, uh, for citizen, for population. And um, if you have a sufficient security institutional culture during your daily activities, it is important to integrate these issues and to ensure inclusive security. For example, Republic of Moldova adopted during the implementation of national action plan a strategy on uh, domestic violence. Uh, but also it's very important, not last at the least, to have this um, critical piece of leadership, especially if they are commitment from the male leaders. And um, you, if you have advice, uh, advocacy for, at the high level of leadership, it's very successful uh, uh, implementation of national action plan. And here you can see that um, during uh, the... Um, when our uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Reintegration, um, Mr. Balan, was ahead, he helped us a lot to push and to um, adopt the national action plan because uh, it was very difficult to convince leadership that we need to this kind of plan. But male le leadership helped us a lot. In this context, the implementation of um, women, peace, and security agenda supports that gender-sensitive policy and practices should be considered as a precondition for responding to challenges and will become a reflex for decision makers involved in ensuring security. And yesterday we discussed, and Saraya, Dr. Sairaya Min mentioned it, how it is important to implement at the national level women peace and security agenda to ensure prosperity. More than then, at the international level, there are indicators that show that the top country uh, uh, from the indicator good governance, they are in the top of uh, women peace and security index. And also the 10 countries from this top are in the top on the human security indicator. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you, Dr. Albu. Uh, so I'm looking out at an audience filled with uh, filled with leaders, right? We've got ambassadors, we've got uh, senior military officers, we've got faculty members from uh, multiple uh, military and civilian schools. We've got students. Uh, we have people who are committed to this issue. So leaders, I welcome your feedback on behalf of our panelists. 